Hello, Trailblazers, and welcome to an edition of Entrepreneur Training inside the Entrepreneur Journey Group. And today, my guest is Alex Hubenthal. And Alex Hubenthal um, is going to show us the a case study in saving taxes by structuring your business as an S-Corp. Um, he's, and for online entrepreneurs, this uh, you may a lot of you may already have structured your business LLC. He's going to tell you why it might make sense to switch to an S-Corp. Or if you haven't yet set up your business structure, why it makes sense to set up as an S-Corp as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Alex. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for having me uh, in your community. I'm happy to be here. And uh, if, you, if, if after the after we do this and put the recording out, we can, you know, if you want to add me into the community, if I'm not already in there, I think I am. But if anybody wants to ask questions or anything like that around this, I'll be happy to jump in and, and answer this because these next two weeks, the last two weeks of December are pretty quiet for us accountants. Everyone kind of checks out in terms of like needing meetings from accountants and stuff. Because by by now, we've pretty much spoken with all of our clients about planning for the end of the year, getting ready for next year, and kind of moving into uh, 2022. So I, I, I put this um, training together uh, a little bit ago, and the numbers in here are used from tax year 2020. The numbers still work. It's just that the tax brackets that are listed on this presentation are for tax year 2020. I just have not updated those yet for 2021. As we're still in 2021, we're closing in 2021. We just actually just finished doing all the tax returns for all of our clients in October <laughs> for 2020. So we're just now uh, getting ready to jump back into it again. So, um, you know, before I jump into this, you know, I, I put a lot of uh, little asterisks, a little like disclaimers in, in what I say. And um, before I even say anything is, you know, I, I, you know, everyone's situation is very unique. Every business is unique. Every individual is unique. Sometimes this would make sense for one business owner, another business owner might, might not make sense to do it. And if you are, if you have the inclination to have a conversation with an accountant, whether it be me or somebody else, you know, I'm, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that you're talking to somebody that is educated in this space, that's educated in this type of knowledge, this information, because it's very technical. And if you just go out and do it yourself, you can open up yourself to a lot of liability and you could really hurt yourself from a tax standpoint, financial standpoint. And I would not want that for anybody in their life. So please, if you're going to, if you, if you want to have a conversation with somebody, be it myself or whoever, that's fine. Um, but, you know, just please, you know, take, take that disclaimer before you do anything with finances or taxes or accounting, because if you don't know what you're doing, you can end up in a lot of trouble. So Without further ado, uh, one of the actual prior clients that I uh, worked with, he, he's no longer a client of ours. He actually wanted to close up his business and uh, go work back in a corporate job. Um, and actually, he sensed that he's left his corporate job and now he's doing his own thing again. So he's, he's a really cool guy. Uh, but his name is Neil. And actually, you know, with the S-Corp election, there's something that a lot of people don't know what the S-Corp election is. And I'm going to educate a lot of you guys on what that is here throughout the presentation. But just so that you know, the S-Corp election is something that you actually, it's a federal election that you make at the federal level. It's not like you do with the LLC when you create an LLC at the state level or a corporation at the state level. But when you switch over yourself to an S-Corp, you actually get to mitigate your exposure to what we call self-employment taxes. And I'll go through you know, what that is. And that's exactly how he was able to save just under $9,000 in taxes in the, in, in the year that we did this. And with the compounding effect of taking that money and putting it somewhere else where the savings that he had in 35 years, he was able to have, a, he could have up to $1.56 million in added net worth just by making this one change to his, um, to his tax structure and his tax strategy. So again, legal disclaimer, again, accounting disclaimer, it's just, again, this is just not considered as legal professional advice. Please talk to somebody that's educated in this space. As I said before, I even jumped to the screen because I'm very apprehensive to this type of stuff, but I want to educate everybody as, as many people as I can, uh, you know, in this space, but please talk to somebody that can help you get you set up correctly. Okay. So I actually took his picture off, off the presentation, but Neil, he's a really cool guy. You know, he's a successful entrepreneur. He's the online space. He does online consulting, marketing consulting for businesses. He doesn't have any employees. Uh, he is a single member LLC, uh, which means that he created an LLC and he's the sole member, sole owner of that LLC. And he resides in the state of Tennessee. Um, and he is also married, right? So like at the time of doing this, these are kind of like the, the metrics that we use because when we talk about accounting, we talk about tax strategy, we talk about numbers that we can save. You know, it's very hard to 
get to the exact number for everybody, right? Because everyone's unique. You know, some kids, some some people have children that get tax credits, they get other things which which affect these numbers as you work through the tax return, as you work through everything. Okay. So just as a little bit of recap for anybody that's not really aware of how or what different types of businesses you know exist in the United States. Um at the very basic level, you have what's called a sole proprietor. That sole proprietorship does not require that you file anything with the state to create uh, the business that, or, or to run or to operate a business. You can just you know run an Etsy shop. You can run a consulting service. You can get 1099 income from doing contracting work. You can do all these different types of things, right? And that income is is reported through what we call Schedule C of your 1040, where your 1040 is your individual tax return. Okay. So whenever you have income from self-employed income, that's what your Schedule C is. And moving down into the LLC, the LLC is um, a state level, con- like a state level agreement where you have with the state saying, "Hey, for for me, for example, I reside in the state of Florida. I operate out of the state of Florida, so I have an LLC in the state of Florida." Okay. And what an LLC does, and you know, at the very basic level, I'm not a lawyer, so you know, don't go talk to a lawyer about this. Uh, but from a tax standpoint, what the LLC does is it provides legal protection, asset separation from your individual assets and your business assets, right? And the purpose of the LLC is that it kind of acts as an insurance policy, if you will. It's not an actual insurance policy, but it acts as one where let's say you have the LLC in place and there's a lawsuit against your business. You lose the lawsuit. There's a settlement cost of $50,000. Well, let's say that the settlement you know, is, you know, is at $50,000 and your business only has cash or assets of $30,000, right? Effectively, what would happen at a very high level is you would liquidate those assets, pay off the settlement with what you had, claim bankruptcy on the business, and then just start over. But the thing that's really nice is that your personal individual assets are protected from the L- with, with the LLC, right? Because if you didn't have the LLC, you'd have the sole proprietorship. And what would happen is, you know, if in that same situation and you were in a supplement $50,000, that would be subject to your investments, your home, your car, all these things. And that kind of leaves you open out in the wind. And that's not, that's not cool. Then there's a thing called the C Corp or the corporation. And the, corp- the C Corp uh, kind of acts a little bit differently. It's, there's a lot more structure to it from a legal standpoint. And it's generally used for, you know, startups, for people that are looking for, um, that are looking for external investors and all these types of things um, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to allow for external investments. And both the LLC and the C Corp is, is done at the state level, right? So moving down into the escrow collection, it's, it's done with, with what we call Form 2553. It's a free form you can download from the IRS's website and you can fill it out. And what's really nice is that the escrow collection is you can attach the escrow collection to the, either the LLC or the C Corp. For a lot of my clients, they're just sole business owners. They don't have a complex, they don't have a complicated business. They're not looking for investors. And, and I think that's you know, the, what the majority of the community is here as well, is uh, they're just operating as, as themselves, right? So what's really nice is, you know, as I mentioned before, is the S-Corp is a federal election and the LLC is a state contract or a state uh, entity, if you will. And what's really nice is you can attach the LLC and the S-Corp together to help mitigate your, mitigate your self-employment taxes. Because what happens is from a tax standpoint, before I jump into the actual charts here in a second, is the sole proprietor in the LLC, if you don't have the escrow collection on there and you're just a single, single owner of the LLC, you actually still flush out your reportings for income and expenses through Schedule C of your individual tax return. Because that's just the law, that's the rule. Like the IRS doesn't care if you're a sole proprietor LLC, if they say it's called a disregarded entity. So because it's what they call a disregarded entity, you're subject to the full amount of these self-employment taxes, which I'm going to get in here in just a second. So, you know, I already talked about the legal separation of, of the businesses for the LLC, but it's really important just to keep in the back of your mind with the LLCs here is that, you know, they're subject to self-employment taxes. And what is self-employment taxes? Well, it's both pieces of Social Security and Medicare tax. So if you've ever received a W-2 or a paycheck from an employer in your life, you'll have seen withholding for Social Security and Medicare tax. 
What you don't see is that your employer actually expenses that same amount of withholding for Social Security, Medicare tax uh, through their income statement, and they actually pay for that half, the other half on your behalf for you. Okay. And then, um, you know, that comes right off the top when you're, you know, when you're calculating your taxes and, you know, before you pay federal, before you even pay state, right? So if you made a hundred thousand dollars in, in taxes, you pay $15,300 in self-employment taxes as the LLC before you pay federal and state. If you live in a state where you pay state income tax. So what's really nice with the escrow collections and what it does, it's, you know, the declaration that you send to the IRS you know, through form 2553, as I mentioned, you can use either through the LLC or the C-Corp, whatever makes more sense for you. And what's nice about the escrow, it's called a pass-through entity, okay? So what that means is, is that whatever the profit is left over gets passed through proportionately to the owners as percentage of holdings uh, at the end of the year, right? So if, again, if you're just a single owner of the, of the business, you own 100% of the company, obviously, right? So whatever the profits are after that gets done, or after you report your, your, your profit or loss for the year, that money gets passed through to you, the individual. And you must report that as income. You must assign a salary with the, sorry, you must assign a salary uh, to yourself as an S-Corp owner, and you only pay taxes on the salary income and any dividends or distributions that you, that you, that you uh, have. So what I mean here, I want to clarify this really fast is you only pay the social security, Medicare taxes on the amount of your salary income that you claim for yourself throughout the, the, at the, at, at the end of the year. And again, every state is different. Some states have different rules on how they, how they calculate things. So how do you Alex, save the money? Sorry, can I st can I ask a question uh, sure. back on that last slide? So sure. um, two things you mentioned that um, the pass through, so the profits come through, right? To right. if you're a sole proprietor, you you get the profits. Now, do you distinguish that between must assign a salary? Can you assign yourself any like say I want to assign myself fifty thousand dollars and then still get all the profits on top of that? Is that the scenario, or is or did is the profits the salary? So that, that, that's a great question. So if you're just a single member LLC, if you don't have this S-Corp election in place, you pay full amount of taxes. Like if you're at $100,000 of profit at the end of the year, you pay 15.3% self-employment tax, then you pay federal, and then you pay state if you live in a state where you pay state income tax. With the S-Corp, the way it works is like, let's say, again, that same situation, $100,000 is, uh, you take a $50,000, sorry, like, for example, what you said, and um, what, what ends up happening is, is you pay... The, the federal withholding and the state withholding and then the social security medicare withholding on your paycheck on your salary that you're claiming for yourself and then whatever is left over you know because your business is going to expense a portion of the social security medicare tax as well so that's going to come out so now you have a hundred thousand dollars less your fifty thousand dollar salary and then let's just say for round numbers sake let's say that the social security medicare tax the other half of that fifty thousand that was expensed by your by your business now gets you to 46. So now you have $46,000 in profit left over. So you already have paid in 50 on your salary through in, into your buckets for federal, for state, for social security, Medicare tax. But now you have 46,000 that needs to be paid up in, in, in federal and then state income tax, but you don't have to pay social security, Medicare tax. That's where the beauty of this thing kind of comes all together and uh, kind of where, where it all, where it all flushes through. Okay. But that's a great question. So how, how do you save so that, you know, you set up the 2553 form, you fax it into the IRS historically before COVID, it took six, eight weeks to get there and get an answer back. Now it's taking about six months. There's some special mm -hmm. rules in here. You have to set that up within the first three months, 15 days of either creating the LLC or uh, three months and 15 days of the new tax year, depending on when your tax year ends, when it starts. Um, and then there's a little bit of gray area in there, asterisk area, where you can request late election relief. And that's usually done it by filing a late uh, late election form uh, when you submit the tax return at the end of the year. So if you talk to an accountant and say, hey, look, you're going to pay out the yin yang on, uh, on Social Security and Medicare taxes this year. Let's get you set for an S-Corp. You'll actually file an S-Corp return. And with that return, you actually file a request for the late relief from the IRS to be allowed to be used as corp for that tax year. <laughs> um, so you need to, that once you get that sent in and you get a, you get a yes, you need to set up a salary for yourself. You can wait until December 31st to do that. Um, just know that you need to get those forms put together. 940, 941s, your, your federal uh, forms. You can pay dividends or distributions. I'm not sure why that's jumping around. 
Um, and then at the and whatever's left over, you have the K one tax form, right? So, uh, and then you what you do is you take your your paycheck, your pay stub that you receive from your business that you've created from your salary. And you take your K one form, and then assuming you live in a vacuum, you just put those two together and you flush out your personal tax return from there. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the detail of this. This is just marginal tax rate data from 2020, um, but it's it's important to know that that exists because that's what, how we base this, these calculations from this conversation. So in this case, uh, you know, let's just say that Neil, uh, his estimated net income for the year, and this is things that we do as accountants coming into the last two months of the year, we sit down with our clients and say, hey, maybe you're not structured this way. You need to get set up this way. And me acting as an accountant, I work very proactively with my clients uh, throughout, throughout the end of the year and throughout the year, but more so in the end of the year, trying to make sure that they're set up for the end of the year to make sure that they're good to go. But in, in this situation, we actually had a conversation. I said, hey, look, Neil, you're, you're doing great for yourself, but I don't want to see you pay way more than you have to. And he said, okay, well, what do you mean? So, you know, kind of the, the way it would work out is, you know, cal calculating his effective tax rate is you, we have marginal tax rates and we have effective tax rates. So in the, in, in the United States, it's, it's you get you pay the percentage for the bracket that you're in, right? So like, just because like I say, if you're at the 24% tax bracket, your total tax is not 24% of your income, right? It's actually just the marginal piece that you're paying in that bucket. So, you know, looking at the federal, uh, at the federal rate, you know, he, you know, he would be in, coming on down because Tennessee has no state income tax, you would have total federal estimated at $27,660. And even though he's in the 22% tax bracket, his effective rate, his averaged rate is 16.86% 16 16 just for federal tax. This is, we're not even talking social security and Medicare tax yet. Mm -hmm. So looking at things, how if he was a single member LLC or even a sole proprietor, because remember from earlier in our conversation, you, the IRS looks at you like like as if you were the same. The thing is, the only thing, only benefit you're getting from the LLC is that legal separation of assets. So, if his net income at the end of the year was 114, just shy of 115 thousand dollars, the way that you start to calculate these things is the IRS gives you a bit of a break, and I use air quotes with the break because it's it's not really a break. But um, what they do is they allow you to take a one half deductible, uh, one half of the deduction for what your self-employment tax would be to calculate your adjusted taxable income. And again, this is a very simplified version because everyone's unique um, just to try to get the point across, okay? So for his self-employment tax, at your total, like I said, 15.3% would be $16,877.46. As you can see, it's not exactly, uh, excuse me, it's $16,247.35. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong line. Um, and so that comes off of right off the top before he pays federal, right? So now because we have the adjusted taxable income, which has been reduced by one half of the self-employment tax, his, self his now federal effective rate is now 14.68%, not the actual 16.86% here, but because we get that deduction because he's self-employed, he gets a little bit of a break, right? So he pays 16247 in, in uh, self-employment tax, 16000 877 in in federal tax and then in tennessee what's really nice is if you actually have an llc or a c corp you have to pay uh effectively what would have been your state income tax because there is no state income tax in tennessee but there is on businesses and they charge 6.5 percent on the franchise tax and then 0.25 percent again every state's different but again this is for him right uh so his take home so he made one hundred fifteen thousand dollars. he's taking home seventy four thousand. he's paying a tax bill of forty one thousand dollars it's insane. So if we moved him over into an S corp again, this is a very, you know, another similar situation, but let's say here, for example, in that $115,000 profit, he has a six, we give him a $65,000 salary. That's through calculations that we make together, trying to make sure he's checking his boxes. And for his salary, you know, he is going to pay up through his, uh, his federal and his, uh, self, his, his social security, Medicare withholding, He's going to have federal withholding of seven thousand four hundred five, and then he's going to have uh, four thousand nine hundred seventy-two dollars and fifty cents on his social security medical withholding on his pay stub. Okay, so now we're sitting just around eleven thousand five hundred in taxes. Okay, so now we come back over same situation over here. We have the net income of one hundred fourteen thousand nine eighty-eight. That's the same number we saw before. The employer paid Medicare and Social Security is the same amount that he had on his 
pay stub, 4,000 at the bottom here, 4,972.50. And then, so that's actually deducted off of the income statement, which is really nice. And then he takes off of the, you know, the, the, the salary for his federal tax that comes off. And at the very end, once we pay out all of our franchise taxes, all the excise taxes and everything else, his take-home salary is 52622 And now he's down to 30351 versus the 41000 Okay. So trying to put this side by side, net income is the same. But now because it's under an S-corp, we get to reduce our, our income by 65000 off for the business. I'm just going to go down the business column first. The employer paid portion of Social Security, Medicare tax, Tennessee franchise excise tax. So the business profit is 41977 Okay. But if it was, you know, and then, and then on the individual side, he takes a 65000 and he has his deductions for, uh, or his withholding, excuse me, for salary, for his federal withholding, and then Social Security, Medicare. And then his take home salary is 52622 So he's taking the business income plus the salary now. Okay. So, adding those two numbers together gets us to 106,977.48 of total income. And you'll see here on this chart that I have already included the amount he's already paid up of 65,000. So now we need to fill in the rest of the 12% bucket. So that difference was 15,000, uh, 14,250, excuse me. So at $14,250 at 12% gets us 1830 and the tax he has to pay through his K-1. And then he fills up the bucket in 22% tax rate. So he's paying off the K-1 an additional $7,710, okay? So now when we get to the final page here, the uh, at least in the, in, the, in the calculations here of how he's saving this much money over the course of the year, you can look side by side to see where the money is flowing to and where it's flowing from. The biggest thing here is, is in, in summary, is that by allowing you to have an S corp, what's happening is, is when you claim that salary that comes off of the taxable income that you're going to report through the K-1 and on that K-1 income, there's no social security, Medicare tax. You effectively get to manage your mit or mitigate your exposure to the, the social security, Medicare tax that you have to pay, right? Because what's paid out through the K-1 is only just federal and then state if you live in a state where there's state income tax, right? So th there's some things in here that you know, that I also wanted just to bring up really fast is, you know, it, in the early 2000s, the IRS found out that a lot of people were just paying $1 salaries to on millions of dollars of profit to avoid paying Social Security and Medicare tax. And that is illegal. That is tax evasion. Don't do that, please. Um, and that's a big no-no. So what the IRS has come up with is they have come up with something called, well, pay yourself what you would pay to replace yourself. And that's called reasonable compensation. That's like a very gray definition that the IRS uses to say, well, like, you know, it should be something like this. And we're like, well, well, what is this? Well, a lot of accountants, a lot of people have different, you know, viewpoints on this. And that's the beauty and the, and the terrible thing about tax laws. There's a bandwidth to work within. Some accountants lean left, some accountants lean right within that bandwidth. But regardless, we're still correct on the tax law. We're still tax. We're still correct within making sure the client or making sure the business owner is compliant with the law, right? That's the most important thing. There's other things where you can say, hey, well, okay, reasonable compensation means I need to look at my hourly rates for uh, you know, what this job would pay and, and you know, marketable rates and all this crazy stuff. If you want to get super technical, you can do that. But I, and again, this is a very loose thing, very loose rule. It's not a perfect rule. But in a situation where you're running $100,000 in profit and you get yourself in an S-corp situation, you want, want to make sure you're paying yourself at least for me, from a risk standpoint, for my clients to make sure their risk audit risk is low and risk of being in trouble with the government is very low, is paying roughly a 50% of their salary what their profit was before salary, right? So $100,000 means you pay yourself a $50,000 salary. And that also makes everybody happy because you're paying sufficiently into Social Security Medicare tax. You're paying probably into state income tax because the majority of states have state income tax. And then also uh, you're paying in over the course of the year on salary into your federal buckets because that helps you avoid paying quarterly estimated payments, which is a completely different conversation. But you know there are things out there that you can, if you pay into the system over the course of the year, you can avoid having to pay quarterly estimate payments, assuming that you're following the rules, assuming you're following you know, everything you need to be doing, and you're working with somebody that knows what they're doing. 
And before I close out, I just want to show you the compounding effect of this. So the 8,963 in the difference in the tax savings at the very bottom, I, I hope you've been reading this while I've been chatting you guys up for a few minutes here on this page, is, you know, is roughly $747, $747 every month that you're going to save in taxes, right? So, you know, from Google, right from Google here, it says the annualized total return for the S&P 500 index of the last 90 years has been 9.8%. That's awesome. That's great. Well, Neil's a pretty young guy. He's just, just around 30 years old. And so he would roughly have 35 years to retirement. Okay. Everyone's different on how this works out. And so we're going to take his monthly savings and we're going to invest that into something for him and you know, let him put that money to work for him. Okay. So instead of 9.8%, I just said 8%. So the 8%, you know, over time, as you can see here on these, on this calculator, it's this compounding calculator is, you know, the length of time in years and then how much the interest rate you're expecting and then compound that annually. That'll get you to 1.556 uh, million dollars, which is huge because that will add directly to his net worth. And if you knew how to play the game and if you knew what you're doing, you can actually put this $750 into something that's actually counted as a deduction, which further even reduces your taxable income on your K1 through your through your S corp. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of levers that can be pulled over the course of the year, and a lot of fun things that you can that you can do. I have another question um, that I'm sure a lot of people that are LLCs might have the same question. Um, if you go to an S corp, do you use the legal? Do you lose the legal protection that you had with the? LLC? That's a great question. So no, you don't. So it's just it's only a federal election. So I, I was joking about this last night with somebody I was talking to, um, and I, 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 I they care but they don't care. Um, where like the government, the federal government and the state government kind of care but they don't care. They they care that you're following the law that you're. Your compliance, but they don't care if you're an LC, an S corp, or a C corp with an S corp. Like, like, but they'll figure it out because when you file the returns, you're you're filing and notifying the government that you're, hey, I'm this, right? Um, but it, it, effectively, the way it works is, you know, again, is that the LLCs or the corporations are created at the state level. They live at the state level. They don't go interstate. They don't live at the federal level. Um, but the but the IRS is aware that you have the LLC because if you have an EIN number like a like the, the employer identification number it's like an eight nine digit number, um, then they're going to know okay well like we can go look in our database the federal government can look in their database at the EIN number and say hey it's ABC LLC we we see that here okay great um, and that's the name listed as the business on the individual tax return but for example like if you have sent in your twenty five fifty three form for your escrow election but you're putting that on top of your LLC, the state level is not, is not really ever going to find out unless you are doing some sort of business activity that requires you to send a S corp tax return to the state level, right? So there are some business activities that require that you file a S corp tax return when you're S corp at the federal level uh, to be sent to the state level so that the state is aware that, Hey, I'm conducting this business activity in this state. I'm subject to this income, this, this, this tax or this reporting requirement or whatever it is um, at the, at the, at the S at the S corp level, but you you would never lose that separation. So, you know, as long as you have either a corporation or you have an LLC in place um, you're never going to lose that legal separation of assets, but that's right. really honestly, like, like really like a very basic thing. You actually, uh, I don't want to plug it too much, but we just, uh, I launched a podcast earlier this year called simple fiscal and we were just talking uh, with my co-host Declan uh, about uh, about this, about like three key things when you're just getting started in business. And one of those was making sure you have a some sort of like legal separation of assets between you and the individual, between you you the you the individual and the business. So you know we were talking about that, and it's just so important because it, it, it's a thing. It's a it's a pain in the butt to ma to manage sometimes because you have to pay a fee every single year. But in all honesty, like at hundred dollars a month or two hundred dollars a month or three hundred dollars a month, whatever you have to pay, again, every state it's different. Um, for me, that 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 amount of money that I invest every year to keep that license or that business active is worth it, just in case something ever happens. Nice, and uh, I'm I wish go ahead and plug away. Uh, uh, in addition to <laughs> that, right. um, because I'm sure a lot of uh, the people listening, their kind of head just kind of exploded. It's like, I don't, I just threw deal everything all... at them in 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to even deal with all these numbers. Well, there's an answer for that. Contact um, Alex and he can yeah. um, help you to let him know about your situation. 
Um, and he can give you a direction on what the best course of action is for you. Yeah. Um, so, and I do free consultations, you know, like, you know, if, if, if we chat for an hour and it doesn't work out great, if you need to talk to me again in six months and then you're ready to, you know, to talk more, whatever that you need, you know, I'm always here to help everybody out as much as I can. That's why the podcast exists is because I realize there's so many people that are just getting started in business that they're like, Hey, I don't need an account. I don't need a bookkeeper. I don't need a tax strategist. I don't need all those bells and whistles. I just need to know I'm following the rules. And that's really what Simple Fiscal was. So Simple, F-I-S-C-A-L.com is. And that's also the name of the podcast. We're on all the platforms. Um, if you go to my Instagram handle, alex.hubenthal, uh, at alex.hubenthal, uh, you'll see me. And then there's like a little link tree thing in there. You can book time directly off of that with me. Um, I know we're going into the year. I've already kind of maxed out my calendar limit for the rest of the year. But those first few weeks of January are, are already opening up uh, on my calendar. So like if you want to hop in and, and have a conversation in the first part of January, it's the best time to do it. Because even though we've already passed through the end of the year, those first two, three weeks of January, are the best time to talk to somebody, especially for a business owner, especially if you don't know what, what you need to do um, to make sure you're in compliance with taxes and make sure that you're ready to go for tax filing day, which I hope this year is April 15th, because a lot of us accountants are a little tired from the uh, seven and 10 month tax seasons we had these last two years with COVID. <laughs> yeah, they should, give, but, they, but should give, they should give you a relief. Yeah, the government should give <laughs> accountants a relief. It's like I, I signed up for this knowing I was going to have the seven day work weeks for three months and 15, yeah, three and a half months. But uh, I, I didn't know about the uh, the COVID, uh, the COVID, uh, uh, extensions and all those things that, that were possible. So, uh, it was definitely, uh, you know, definitely, a, a, a professional learning experience for sure, uh, going through that and trying to help clients get things figured out because even when the government was shut down and all these things were closed, you know, it was impossible to get answers. Like we, we had sent out 25, 25, 53 forms for clients in October of 2020. And thankfully we didn't have those extensions uh, in place because it, we were waiting, we were sitting on our hands until the end of July to get confirmation that we had that because we couldn't file the S Corp or an LLC per se until we had the confirmation from the IRS to say, yep, you are now S Corp. Congratulations, go file the S Corp return. So, you know, it, it was really good to have those extensions out there. But, um, you know, I think this year we're pretty much back to normal or the new normal, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 even, even though, you know, all, you know, the best, the best time to talk to somebody is before the end of the year, but the second best time is, is after the end of the year before tax filing, de the tax filing deadlines. Um, but you know, as I, I forget who said it, but I think it was Lincoln that said it's like the best time to plant trees was yesterday. Second best time yeah. is today. Yeah. Same thing with tax, same thing with tax, tax conversation. So it would it be myself or anybody else, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll, Doug, I'll send you over my links and we can get those plugged in there. Um, and then if you have any questions, again, free consultations, I'm not here to try to sell you. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm here to help you. And the more people I can help, the better I feel. And, uh, the more that I know that people are going to be more successful in what they do. Uh, just one real quick question before we leave. So sure. in that consultation, will they have a good idea after the consultation of how much they could possibly save on taxes? If we're having a conversation around this, yes, it's it's very oh, awesome. it's very straightforward. But like you know, maybe they're in a situation where they're not doing a hundred thousand dollars a year in profit, and they're doing fifty thousand dollars in profit. I said, well, hey, Sally or Bob or Joanne or whoever I'm talking to, um, you know, say, hey, like you're not going to save twenty five hundred dollars in this, you know, or you know, five thousand dollars in taxes by doing this. We could try to save you twenty five hundred, but if we do that, we need to do X, Y, and Z, and then I say, okay, here's this option that's available to you but just know it's going to take a lot of work for us to make sure we get that done on time. Is it worth it to you to do it, to save that money? Yes. Okay. We'll do it. But if not, like I get it, let's just, let's, let's eat it for this year and let's fix it for this year. Right. Because like, there's only like, you know, it, it's me, it's all about me trying to offer the solution that's best to the client mm -hmm. and make sure that they're aware of all the options that are available to them because we can just say, Hey, let's just eat, let's just eat the crow. And like, let's just, you know, we screwed up this year. We're after the January 31st deadline. If we try to go fix this now, we're going to have these fees. We're going to have this penalty. We're going to have X, Y, Z, whatever. Does that negate the savings we're going to get? Right. Because if it does, and it makes sense for us to do it, we'll do it. But if not, we might just have to say, okay, like, look, we screwed up. Let's get you on the right track for this year and move forward. Nice. Um, and if I just want to remind all the entrepreneurs, online entrepreneurs, especially solopreneurs that are watching, as many hats as you can take off, 
um, that you're trying to wear, the better you're going to be at growing your business. So that accounting hat may be need to go to someone like Alex, um, who because it can rack your brain. It can take up a lot of your uh, time yeah. uh, in growing your business. And if you have someone that you trust that that you know is going to uh, do what's best for your business, please do that. And so Alex's links are going to be below. Um, but I encourage everyone to find someone to help them. Yeah. Uh, somebody that's knowledgeable, area. somebody that is is has been doing it for more than a year or two. Uh, I've been, I mean, I, I worked in just so that you know, just so everyone can kind of hear me. I studied finance and accounting in the university. I went to corporate life and I worked in SMBs, and I didn't want to do that anymore because I wanted to help people directly. And I've been doing this for seven years, so I have you know corporate experience. I you know I've helped take businesses from you know some e-commerce clients that I work with have gone from hundred thousand a year to six million a year in revenue. I'm still working with them. And it's amazing just to be a part of that. It's amazing to help make sure that, you know, it's not just taxes, it's cash flow. It's making sure that you're managing your expenses. It's making sure that you can allocate, you know, the money that you have to make sure you, keep, you can keep running your business, that you can pay yourself, that you can feed yourself, that you can make sure you take care of your obligations as well. It's not just that, but taxes is our, our, our big thing as part of that, um, because that does help drive a lot of money that you do keep do get to keep uh, for the money that you work for. So, that, you know, you want to make sure you're trying to do as much as you can to mitigate that. Um, but it's also other things as well. Uh, so we, we will, we will sign off in just a second. I just want to also mention that Alex, a large majority of his clients in our, from our previous conversation are online entrepreneurs. So you would, if you wanted to, uh, hire Alex, he has a very good grasp of the things that you deal with on a daily basis. Yes. So, um, all right. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, click the links below to get in touch with Alex and we'll see you on the next training. All right. Thanks guys. Take care.